Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by thanking everyone for attending our webinar today on patient and provider perspectives on biosimilars. Many of you have interacted with one or more of us over the last few months as we've been preparing for a pivotal moment in 2023 when the adalimumab biosimilars are able to come to market, which is going to be a big sea change for many of our patients on uh, with autoimmune conditions who rely on self-administered biologics to maintain their disease. So with that, we only have a handful of slides today because we really wanna keep this conversational, but we have two panels for you today to really bring the insights to life. We have a patient panel with four uh, patients who span psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and other forms of arthritis. And then we have a provider panelist panel with a rheumatologist um, and a dermatologist to give us the provider perspective. I want to just go over a couple of housekeeping notes. Because we want this to be very conversational, we want to be addressing your questions and hear your feedback in real time. We invite you to use the chat uh, or Q&A buttons. We'll be monitoring as we go, and we will do our best to address any questions in real time. However, we will also allow time at the very end just to go through Q&A if you do have questions that you want to save for the end. In terms of session objectives, what we are hoping for is that when you walk away from us today, you will have a deeper understanding of patient and provider preferences, concerns, and questions about biosimilars uptake, that you will have a good understanding of why patient and provider confidence is key to successful uptake, for example, preventing the nocebo effect, that you'll have a good understanding of, of the importance of the patient-provider relationship in making decisions about switching, and that you'll have a clear understanding of how you can specifically incorporate the findings that we're going to share with you today into your own coverage and or communications practices. Uh, and above all, of course, our overarching objective around biosimilars entering the market in the first place is that patients will benefit from the lower costs um, and, you know, certainly the systemic benefits that could come from biosimilars ent entering the market are, are really huge, but we really want to sort of bring the focus down to the patient level um, and remember why costs are, are a concern in the first place. Before we formally introduce the first panel, we had a couple of slides of insights to share with you. We recently embarked upon a survey to better understand patient insights. We asked a number of questions about knowledge levels of biosimilars around uh, just thoughts and perspectives about switching to a biosimilar, particularly for patients who are currently stable on a biologic medication, and then asked a series of questions about communications preferences and things like that in terms of, you know, how and when a patient might want to learn that they might be switched to a biosimilar. These are the sort of insights that the panel is going to go through in greater detail and that we hope are going to be really informative for you all. So uh, starting with this first slide here, knowledge and comfort levels, we found that 49% of respondents had never heard of a biosimilar um, or had only heard the term but don't really know what that means. I thought that was really instructive in terms of where you think about starting um, in educating patients about biosimilars, that they may be coming in with a very low um, baseline of, of knowledge around what a biosimilar is. 85% uh, of those surveyed would want to know if they were receiving receiving a biosimilar in place with their biologic. I thought that was really interesting um, as well. We tend to, to hear that in surveys that patients want to know what kinds of coverage decisions are being made, um, even if it is a switch to something that's therapeutically equivalent. And only 29% really know the difference between a reference biologic and a biosimilar. So that sort of layers on that sort of piece around needing to educate just from a very basic level about what biosimilars are, that the difference between a biosimilar and a reference product may not be fully known. This, I, I thought, is really that this next bullet point is really sort of the crux of why we're here, that education is key, particularly for biosimilar naive respondents. 67% would be open to using a biosimilar if they had more information. Uh, but with what they know now, only 23% would be comfortable. So as we're thinking about getting that comfort level uh, among patients um, and hopefully preventing, you know, any sort of negative experiences they may have with a biosimilar, that education is, is really key. And if a biosimilar might be an option, they're most concerned about what happens if they have a bad reaction, which makes sense. A lot of patients, particularly with autoimmune disease, can have uh, either negative reactions to starting new therapies, um, or it just takes quite some time to find one that works for them. And they may be a few years down the road and, and taking a particular medication and then it stops working. So having sort of a process to quickly shift gears is, is really important. 
And of course, they want to know, are there going to be other requirements like prior authorization or step therapy? Are the costs going to be lower? Those are, are questions that come up often. And then the biologic experience patients were tended, tended to be more concerned with specific details around the, the, you know, sort of efficacy, safety, things like that. All right, on messaging and communication, these are the things that I'm hoping will be be really informative as we think about sort of best practices around how and when to communicate with patients. But uh, not surprisingly, healthcare providers were the preferred source of communication for information about biosimilars. 89% um, said that, followed by patient groups, the FDA, pharmacists, and then health plans. So really, it's a mix of places that people look for information. And in my thinking, the, the, the more uh, stakeholders that are reaching out proactively to, to patients about biosimilars, biosimilars, the better, so that we're sort of covering all the bases. Um, safety risks, treatment, efficacy, and side effects were the top types of information that were of interest, and then, of course, call, followed by if it will be covered by insurance. Um, if switching to a biosimilar is an option, the patients want to know in advance of the, of the patent expiration, in theory, if that's possible, and or when the switch is imminent. It's just a matter of wanting to sort of be an active partner throughout the course of their sort of care decisions. And then nearly all wanted to hear about the switch from their doctor's office. So that I think is going to be a really interesting conversation to have today with the patients on the panel and then with the provider panelists as well about how that communication might happen and really sort of getting to the essence of how and why that patient provider connection is, is really going to be key. It, interestingly, in our survey, email came up as a preferred communication channel. Um, and certainly that is an, an effective one or can be an, an effective one. But in, in sort of digging in further in conversations with both patients and providers, there was a lot of emphasis on in-person communication, which we think can sort of cover a lot of ground as well. So I'm looking forward to digging into that in a few minutes. And then last but not least for the moment, messaging about the clinical safety and effectiveness resonates most when we asked about what types of messages would resonate or make you feel more comfortable with the biosimilar. They wanted clinical safety and um, effectiveness data, and then stories from other patients who have switched to biosimilars. And I feel like this tracks pretty well with some outside research that has been done, um, which I think is hopeful in terms of being able to apply different recommendations and best practices around communication. I think real world data also goes a long way to the extent that that's available. That really helps with comfort levels as well. That is the last slide for the moment. I am going to turn it over to Jason Harris, uh, my counterpart over at the National Psoriasis Foundation, who is going to introduce the patient panel and get us started on those questions. Thank you, Anna, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, and also shout out to Anna and her team um, and ACR and AAD. It's been great to, to partner on this work. So I'll welcome all the uh, the panelists for our first panel to join us, Nicole, Deb, Rick, and Ted. As Anna mentioned, I'm, I'm Jason, Vice President for Government Relations and Advocacy at the National Psoriasis Foundation. We've got about 15, 20 minutes here. We're going to dive into a few questions. But first, I just want to give everyone a chance to do uh, brief introductions, a little bit who you are, your relationship to uh, either psoriatic disease or arthritis. And also, I'm going to throw in an extra question. The first time you heard about a biosimilar, I thought Anna's point there uh, about sort of folks who haven't heard about it, just might be interesting to hear uh, when you first heard of it. So, Deb, I'm going to kick it to you first. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Deb Constein. I'm in the Madison, Wisconsin area, longtime volunteer for the Arthritis Foundation. I have had RA since I was 13 years old. And the first time I heard about a biosimilar was when my nurse practitioner from my rheumatologist office called me saying that I was being switched to a biosimilar. It was way back with Remicade. So that was when I was moved to Renflexus. Thank you, Deb. And Nicole, please go next. Hi, I'm Nicole Greenland I'm from Oakland, California. I've had psoriasis for 10 years and psoriatic arthritis for six years. And I also have family members that, that have psoriatic disease. I first heard of biosimilars when I was actually, I had failed Humira and my next uh, biologic offer to me was a biosimilar, it was in Flectra. So I never did try Remicade. I was just introduced to Inflectra and explain what a biosimilar was at the time. Next up, uh, Rick. Hi, Rick Phillips from Noblesville, Indiana, just a little bit north of Indianapolis. I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, type 1 diabetes, 
And the first time I heard about Biosimilar was actually in 2015 at ACR. I attended a, a, a wonderful event. It was a debate between two rheumatologists about the applicability of biosimilars. And I have just been absolutely fascinated ever since and have studied the proposition and have anxiously awaited the coming days. And Ted, last up. I'm Ted Godwell. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I have had rheumatoid arthritis since I was age two, I guess juvenile rheumatoid arthritis at that time. I've been a long time volunteer with the Arthritis Foundation for a couple of decades now. And uh, first time I heard of biosimilars was probably in connection with my work with the Arthritis Foundation and maybe on the advocacy committee and understanding what, what is that? Because I had been on biologics myself, but uh, had not been on a biosimilar. And so it was probably through my work with the Arthritis Foundation that I first heard about it. Appreciate it, Ted. Well, okay. I think I um, appreciate all the intros. And again, thank you for joining us. I think, and I know we have a couple of folks uh, who have been on a biosimilar. So I'm curious, um, and maybe we can start with, Nicole, we'll start with you here. But overall, what was your comfort level when you did switch? And then Rick, for you, just in general, we can get to like what your comfort level might be. Um, and, and Ted and Ted, of course, uh, follow up after Nicole. You know, I was very open to trying anything. <laughs> I was, my psoriatic arthritis became very severe, very fast, um, as, along with my psoriasis was severe. And I'd already tried several medications and I was just, I just wanted my life back. And I was very open to trying a biosimilar. Um, again, I didn't have Remicade to compare Inflectra to, but I was very open about it and discussed the side effects with my rheumatologist. And yeah, I went in very hopeful. As far as my comfort level goes, I also did testify on behalf of biosimilars um, legislation here in Wisconsin. My story was a little different. Um, I think my comfort level, I was, I had a lot of questions. Dietetics is my background. So science and research is right up my alley. And um, I asked a lot of questions. I kind of pelted my poor, poor nurse practitioner. In my case, I've had RA since for over 40 years. And in this is what I testified on behalf of um, biosimilars is it offers so many more choices for folks like me who have gone through all the biologics. So offering those other choices and throwing more into the pool was very important to me. Rick or Ted, any, uh, any other thoughts there? Well, Especially for you, Rick, in terms of, you know, the kind of uh, hypothetical, we'll call it for now. I was able to tour a Janssen manufacturing plant back in 2018 or 19, where they were processing their biologic medication. We discussed biosimilars on that tour. They they were actually processing Remicade. And I think the moment that I became absolutely sold on the idea was when the Tour guide said that the two the two reference batches, the one established in Europe and the one established in the United States, had diverged, uh, and they were different uh, because they're living organisms, and since they are living organisms, they take on characteristics of their own. So, in fact, the European version is a biosimilar of the U.S. version, which is a biosimilar of the European version. When I heard that explanation. I was just absolutely floored. It made the entire difference for me. Ted, any uh, any final thoughts there? Oh, I mean, I guess I mirror a lot of what other people have said, and I didn't. I don't have any particular qualms about biosimilars, but just wanting to know more about it and understanding what the difference is, at least at first, between what they're reference biologic was and biosimilars. Yeah, education definitely continues to to be key, especially for, even though y'all have probably, you, y'all heard about it years in advance of, of some others, but I think uh, from just the survey data Anna showed and, and what we know, um, certainly talking to folks here at MPF is that still is a, a huge need. So I kind of want to, I'm going to switch it up, Ted, I'm going to come to you here, but overall, what do you see as sort of like a value proposition to switching or, or do you see one um, sort of from your perspective? Well, I, you know, I start a little bit with the value proposition and saying <clears throat> what that means. And I guess it, to me, I think that, you know, it's clearly the direction things are going. We are going to have biosimilars and that's the way of the future. And to say that we're going to, you know, be tilting in windmills here and saying, no way, no how, no, that it's happening. And so I think that it's more a matter of understanding on both sides what it means from a patient's perspective, from an insurance perspective, from the doctor, the provider's perspective and making sure that everyone is on the same page. So in general, I think we need to educate the patients in terms of what it is, what, what it means giving them advance notice. 
I think that as, as those surveys said, what two thirds are comfortable with it when they get more information. And then in general, uh, you know, it may be, there may be a cost savings, there may be a benefit, the insurance companies may be saying you have to or should be getting a biosimilar. And that's generally fine as long as it is working for the patients, but that there also is a feedback loop for the patients to say to their doctors, if it's not working, hey, it's not working for me. And that there be a, a, a ability to override that and say this this particular patient needs to go back to the uh, reference biologic because it was working for him or her, whereas this is not, the biosimilar is not. And in most cases, the vast majority, it should work. So patients shouldn't be afraid of switching, but there should be a mechanism whereby you have that feedback loop to say, it's not working, I need to go back. Because I know from my own experience, I've over my 50 years of having the disease, I've had a number of products that I've gotten a number of treatments that I've been told, you know, this works for a vast majority of people with rheumatoid arthritis. I'm like, nope, but it didn't work for me. And others, yeah, it works swimmingly. There has to be that feedback loop in order to understand and both have the understanding of both sides. Excellent. I think you outlined that really well. So Rick, Deb, curious, um, you know, would did well, any questions you did have about switching or, or would you, but then also um, I kind of want to get to uh, some of what, what Anna had showed there. Who would you want to hear? Who would you want to hear about a potential switch? How far in advance? What format? Kind of get into that, and then Nicole, uh, definitely want to come to you for the, for the same questions there. You know, uh, in my case, uh, my doctor and I discuss uh, biologics, the the uh, uh, world of biologics. Every time I visit with her, uh, we discuss what I'm using and what's next. It's always a matter of. Uh, uh, it, it's usually a matter of what I hear from my doctor. Uh, it, so I think keeping the doctor informed is is the very best thing. And then I think other patients are the next best thing. I know that the user groups, uh, this is a hot topic in the user groups, having patient partners who are willing to go out front and discuss biosimilars is, is I think, going to be critical. Uh, for the industry uh, and for the smooth transition. As we know, in patient groups, uh, information can get so distorted so quickly. If we can, uh, if we can have uh, uh, people who uh, understand biologics speaking on biosimilar, speaking on their behalf, I think it's going to make a big difference. Thank you, Rick. And Deb, you said you had a lot of questions. I wondered, can you can you list some of those out or, or expand on some of those? I think um, a lot of it came to the efficacy and what did a biosimilar mean? What is the similar part? And she went scientific with me, which is kind of the level she knows she can go with me. Being a dietitian, I understand um, the crux of what she was getting at. Going back to what Ted said, the biosimilar didn't work for me. So I was able to go back to the reference um, medication. So luckily that that did play out. And I did ask that question when we um, when I was going through it. Um, at that point, I wasn't thrilled because I was doing pretty well with um, the Remicade. So again, but still open to have that option um, available to myself. Um, and I, I, I definitely got into the science of it um, and asked a lot of questions related to the science and how does that all play out. And I was pretty sold. I understood why. I think at that point, the cost savings really never made it w its way to me. I'm hoping, I'm definitely hoping that is the case this time since it's getting so much information that's coming out about it. So I think that's it. And I hearing from either my nurse practitioner who I've got a relationship with or my rheumatologist a phone call is okay. I hope that they wouldn't wait till my appointment to let me know as time's ticking. I want to kind of do my own research as well. And Nicole, I know uh, similar to what Deb said, we got into a conversation as, as we were chatting sort of about the cost, the cost piece in terms of, you know, where, where sort of maybe those savings go as we hear that biosimilars are going to save. Curious, you want to ex expand on that, Nicole, but then also I want to get to kind of our last question, which is what kind of messages do you think might resonate most with individuals, you know, obviously in our space, immune mediated, autoimmune, but patients in general um, on the safety of switching, if there's any perspectives you have there. I know you, you like to dive into the science as well, just like that. Yes, yes, I do. And I want to go back and just say, when I did try the biosimilar, I was in my first year diagnosis, but I, I failed that, that medication and many others after that. So my situation now is very similar to Deb. I finally found one that sort of works, but wears off very quickly halfway through the, through the, the duration of the dosage. 
So now, you know, um, I look at it as another option. When I did try the biosimilar, the savings didn't get to me as well. What kind of what kind of messages do you think might resonate with sort of other individuals living with you know chronic diseases and and conditions about the safety of switching? Or is there anything that resonated with you as you were kind of doing your research? You know, I think the big thing, and I participate in many online support groups uh, for autoimmune conditions, and one specific to me. The big thing that comes up in those discussions is, you know, if I switch, is it going to be as effective? And can I switch back? And then the other, you know, are the, are the side effects similar? Are there any other safety issues? How well tested is it? But the big one is, you know, I don't want to leave this medicine that works well for me right. and go to things that might not work. Quite well taken. Okay, we got about a minute left. So Ted, Rick, Deb, I want to see if there are any messages you thought to kind of hit on that last question. I know um, it's something that the provider panel will likely get into too. Any anything you've seen in, in your volunteer work? I know you, all three of you've been really active with with arthritis, the arthritis foundation about any of the safety of switching or things you've heard. I think the most that I'm hearing is the hesitancy, just not understanding and not understanding what a biosimilar is. I I am thankful that um, the Arthritis Foundation and the National Psoriasis Association, you're all coming together and getting that information in the patient's hands. So I think, again, it's not the worst thing in the world. I think it is definitely a great thing that's coming our way. It's more science and um, just be open to it and listen, listen to what your doctor's telling you and um, do some of your research on your, uh, on your own. I would just reiterate some of those same things that, again, you, so many people with arthritis have gotten to this point where they've struggled with a lot of different medications that haven't worked. And when they finally find one that does, and then you tell them, guess what? We're going to pull the rug out from under you and give you something else. And it should be just as good. But your radar antenna goes up and says, what do you mean just as good? I've heard that before. So if they've come from the doctor's office and they're explaining what a biosimilar really is and that it really should work and, you know, kind of encourages you that I think depending on the patient level, they can communicate, they know how to communicate with their patients and what level of information they need, but that can get people comfortable with it. But then that you also have, as Dev has talked about in others, feedback loop to say, if it's not working, I can go back to the doctor and say, it's not, here's why. Feedback loop. uh, It'll be in our follow-up report. Rick, any final thoughts? Uh, Just... The thing that swayed me in in the absolute end was even reference products are similars of each other. We've been okay. using biosimilars for a very long time. Well, I want to thank Nicole, Deb, Rick, Ted. Thank you for joining us to, to share your expertise and thoughts and perspectives. We will go off camera now, turn it back over to Anna. Welcome to the next panel. Well, I want to thank the, uh, the patient panelists. That was really a wonderful conversation. And uh, we're going to, we have one more slide that shows some of the Uh, data points on the provider side as we get ready for the the provider panel. But I just kind of wanted to roll up too, because we've done a lot of conversations and focus groups with patients uh, to to kind of round out the conversation that it seems to me in addition to kind of safety, efficacy, what happens if it doesn't work as well. There are a lot of practical questions that have come up is what is the coverage going to look like? What is the likelihood that I'm going to switch as these things come to market? Will manufacturer be assistance be available um, to the extent that there are patients who, you know, rely on that? Those kinds of really practical, you know, how is this going to change my day-to-day life? I think there's also some disconnects that we have found around how much the, the medication truly will be the same, and not just the medication itself, but like the injection device, for example. You know, we know that injection devices are going to be different, but how different? Making sure that patients are prepared for what those differences are so that if they are going to switch, that it's as seamless a transition as possible. So that would be sort of one of my takeaways from the conversations that we've had. So moving into the provider insights, we had a rheumatology survey that we did with the American College of Rheumatology that showed some really, I think, eye-opening insights. And this first one, I think, um, in particular, while nearly three out of four rheumatologists are comfortable prescribing biosimilars for new patients, 53% are opposed to switching stable patients to one. So I think a lot of the concerns around, is there going to be an issue with switching, exist within the rheumatology community um, as well. And it seems that from a lot of previous data uh, points, surveys that have been done, that the idea of starting new patients on a biosimilar seems relatively comfortable to, to most providers. I'm really interested. I'm sort of teeing up our uh, provider panelists here with these with these insights. Um, so I'm very curious to get their reaction. 
Um, 64% are concerned that the patients that are stable may not respond as well. So, you know, I think that that's uh, going to be an interesting point to really think about for all stakeholders involved as we move into next year, having these available in the U.S. for the first time. 53% um, of rheumatologists surveyed were opposed to switching stable biologic to a biosimilar. And then 79% of respondents say that patients will be confused or concerned if they are switched to a biosimilar. So, you know, I think what that really speaks to is the importance of education, which, which I hope uh, we've done a good job of convincing everyone here that how important that is, uh, but also that, you know, sort of mitigating the confusion, any sort of confusion um, will then mitigate some of the concern. And if you mitigate those things, then it's going to help the patient have a smooth transition in and prevent some of those things like the nocebo effect, which, you know, we certainly are, are concerned about and feel um, could be sort of a, a downside if, if these patient education pieces aren't prioritized. Okay, so with that, I am going to invite our two provider panelists to join me on screen here and we can take off the slides. I will introduce both of them. And then I have a, just a series of a handful of questions that I would like both of them to sort of dive into with me. Uh, but first introductions, Dr. Marcus Snow is a clinician and an assistant professor in the Division of Rheumatology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He serves as the chair of the ACR's Committee on Rheumatologic Care that touches on policies related to the practice of rheumatology, including biosimilars. And then we have Dr. Alexander Gross, who is a der dermatologist and practicing for Olansky der Dermatology in Georgia. He completed a dermatology residency and fellowship at Vanderbilt University and is board certified in both the fields of internal medicine and dermatology. And he is the current chair of the American Academy of Dermatology Association State Policy Committee. Okay, welcome both. So um, I certainly would welcome both of you to give any reaction to either of those uh, data points or anything you heard from the patient panel. But um, so think about that. And then I will also give you the first official question, which is how are providers thinking about the benefits and risks of biosimilar substitution? Um, and I wanna focus on that word substitution because that seems to be where the, the most tension points are at the moment. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Snow. Yeah, you know, I think that it's, I think that you, you see a wide um, variety of, of comfort and familiarity with, with this, um, with biosimilars. I think that the initiation of um, IV um, and fliximab with biosimilars has been a big benefit, I think, you know, as we enter 2023, um, at least in the rheumatology world, just because, because um, folks have had a lot of exposure to biosimilars in that regard, um, and it started that conversation you know, a couple of years ago when this started, it's, it's, you know, I've been on, um, on the ACR's committee on rheumatologic care, um, for five out of the last six years and going back in time, you know, I was part of discussions that where, you know, we had discussions on what biosimilars were and how, how exactly they were, um, you know, how, you know, when they were coming to market and, and we weren't sure when they were coming and how they were coming and, and how the, how the studies were going to be done. And that's how it started. And now it's evolved to the point where, where, we're all very familiar with them, uh, and we're, we're more, much more comfortable with them. And I think that we're, we're entering a world where things are changing fast, and we're ready for it. But 2023 is going to be a very different year with subcutaneous biosimilars. Dr. Gross. So I think that, you know, first and foremost, we're all concerned mainly about the safety and efficacy of these drugs. And the Food and Drug Administration, when they deem biosimilar to be interchangeable with the reference molecule, are supposedly reassuring us that the, the medicines are going to be safe and that they're going to be effective. As we heard from, you know, one of our panelists on the patient panel, the biosimilar drugs may, may not be as effective as the reference drug in every case, and, and every patient is different. So there's going to be a wide range of variability. And it'll be interesting to see amongst the different biosimilars that, that come out for uh, adalimumab in 2023, whether or not they, they all have the same safety and, and efficacy profile. Let's talk a little bit about the patient provider relationship, which has been obviously a big uh, theme throughout the conversation so far. But I would love to hear from the provider perspective. Why is that so Why is the conversation between the patient and the provider about the appropriateness of a biosimilar so important? And Dr. Gross, let's start with you this time. I, I think that there needs to be um, a comfort level with regard to both the, the physician and the patient. And I think that the physician and the patient need to have a discussion about switching. I think that there are going to be some patients who will have 
no trepidation with regard to, to making a change, especially if there are access uh, easing um, for making the change, if it, if it becomes um, financially beneficial for them to switch to the bio biosimilar. And I think that there's gonna probably be another subset of patients we're going to be very anxious about making a change because they're going to be worried about, uh, you know, a, a side effect maybe that that shows up that that didn't show up with the reference drug, uh, or whether or not they're going to have the same um, response to the, the biosimilar. Yeah, I think that that it comes down to the discussion. I think that that um, it, and, and I think that our our patient panelists, I think every single one of them hit upon this is the communication amongst the patient. Um, and the provider, I think, is really important, and and it's something that that you know I've been trying to um, discuss with my patients when I have the opportunity um, over the past couple of years who were on adalimumab and other other biologics um, that the biosimilars are coming that I think they're um, they've been proven to be to be um, essentially equal, um, you know, as far as looking at the, the the biochemistry all the way to to patient response. Um, but they are coming if they have questions to let us know. But but it's something that you might they might be hearing about, and just to kind of set the stage that that we might be having these discussions, so that it's not a panic when all of a sudden they, they go to pick up their their Humira and it looks different. Yeah, that hits on an interesting point. We say oftentimes that every stakeholder across the ecosystem has a distinct responsibility when it comes to uh, communicating or just general uptake of biosimilars. We've, I feel like we've talked a lot about the provider and the patient here, and we can get into further detail about what our distinct roles are here. But a lot of the attendees today are representatives of that ecosystem. We have manufacturers, we have pharmacists, we have payers, PBMs, distributors, et cetera. So I would love to know what your thoughts are on what the roles might be from your vantage point, the conversations, you know, the things that go well and the things that end up not going well when it comes to you know, patient care. What do you see as the distinct roles of some of those uh, stakeholder groups in making sure that patients do have a smooth transition if switching is going to be an option for them? Uh, Dr. Snow, let's start with you. Yeah, you know, it, there, there's so many different layers to this that, you know, from the manufacturing of the of the medication to the patient taking the medication that, that um, communication is going to be key. It, and and it's, it's going to be tough, I think, it's in, in some respects, um, and especially initially when when Substitution is, is happening. Uh, obviously, there are different state rules that that apply in different locations um, as far as who's notified of substitution um, when it happens. Um, so it's 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 going to be tough. I think that that um, it's something we will get through, and and um, it's going to require communication um, from provider to patient. I, I think the biggest concern, and as you look at that that data that was presented in all the conversations I have had with rheumatologists about biosimilars, the biggest concern is if I have a patient who's stable and they're doing well on the reference product, we have fought for years to get to that point. You know, we have, it has taken a long time in some cases. And the last thing you want to do is give up something that has worked well, even if the, the product they're getting is near identical. And, and so that's when you see that hesitancy, when you notice on all those survey responses, that I think is what the providers are, are commenting upon is that, that they, that they really want to make sure that, that if they do have to change, and I think Ted mentioned the feedback loop when he was talking. And I think that, that if, if we do have to switch from, from Humira to a biosimilar and, and things don't go well, the ability to easily and return back to Humira without financial penalty to the patient would be something that, that is a, would be a huge comfort level for, for a lot of folks. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of biosimilars. I think that, that I would be fine starting with starting my patient on a, on a biosimilar um, as a first a first line drug. Um, but but if someone who I have fought for years to get control of their psoriatic arthritis has to switch and then all of a sudden things don't go well, um, I, I you know I think that that I don't want to have to write five different letters and be on the phone five different times to talk to somebody in order to get them back on something that we know works. And that's the biggest concern I think you see amongst, at least I've seen amongst providers when they talk about this. Dr. Gross. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think that the less intervention that the third party payers have in the decision-making process that really should be taking place between the um, physician and, and the patient, that the better it's gonna be for everybody. So there are a couple of questions that have come into the chat that I would love to sort of pivot to for a minute here. Um, let's start with 
for, for both of you in the rank order of your priorities, where would you place actively trying to get or counsel patients on a switch to a biosimilar? Could, could you read that question again? I'm sorry. In your sort of order of priorities, where would you rank? And let's say sort of five high, one low, um, sort of taking stable patients. I'm assuming that the question is referring to stable patients and switching them to a biosimilar. Where is uh, sort of actively working with them to switch? Where does that rank in your priority? And the person who asked that question, if I didn't capture the integrity of that right, please let me know. I mean, I, I would agree that if you've got a patient that's that's stable on on treatment, I I personally would do everything that I could to to fight to keep the patient on on the treatment if they're happy and comfortable and they're doing well. So you know, I I, I would would rank that very high. Yeah, I, I think it, it depends on the scenario. I think um, I you know I I think that the the this this presumes that as a as a physician, I have the ability to choose between a bio originator and a biosimilator, biosimilar. And, and I, I don't know where that's going to be, if that's going to be an option in the future. Based on current formulary um, development um, and the trends in that, we just haven't seen that, that we have as much choice as maybe many people think we do um, when I'm starting someone on a, on a biologic medication. So would you know where would I actually try to counsel them? I, I I try to reassure my patients whenever I think that a, a switch is coming that I think it would be okay. But there are going to be certain patients where I would I will fight tooth and nail to keep them on the same medication they're on. It may not be a majority of patients, but it's going to be certainly something that I'm going to do. Um, you know, if if I have someone who has we've struggled for years and years and years to get control, and and, and now we have to make a switch. So another question that came in here has to do with the role of specialty pharmacy. So in terms of providing patient education and ongoing care management, including patient assessments, are you all providers collaborating with the patient specialty pharmacy in the case of orals and self-injectables? And she says here, most specialty pharmacies are in contact at least every 30 days. So the, I, I love this kind of question because it's really tactical and the things that are really gonna matter in terms of just smooth rollout. Um, interested in, in your view on, on how the pharmacist can help with outcomes, what does that feedback loop look like between the provider and the specialty pharmacist? Well, you know, I think that, and I'll kind of answer from, from my experience, I work at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and we have a, a specialty pharmacy, which does a lot of our uh, follow-ups. And so I can follow an electronic medical record of their conversations, but but they don't fill the majority of my patient's prescriptions. Um, those, those are contractually dependent on their insurer um, and their PBM usually. Um, and so those conversations I'm not a part of. I think that it's, in, it's in a very important point that is being made is that, you know, whoever is communicating with the patient, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a team effort to communicate, you know, what's happening and, 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 and educating. I think it starts, you know, from, from my point of view, it starts when I'm signing the prescription and sending it in um, and potentially forewarning the patient that even though I've written for Humira, it may end up being a different medication. And, and that's something that I've tried to control. But, but I think that we're going to learn a lot when, when 2020, by the end of 2023 uh, regarding substitution and communication because uh, this is going to happen frequently. And, and a lot of our phone calls, we're going to get tons of phone calls and faxes when things change. And we're going to have to have a process in place. I miss the good old days where patients would come in and we would see them and evaluate them. And we would write a prescription and the patient would take the prescription to the pharmacy. And then the patient would leave the pharmacy with the medication. Um, we have a designated person in our office who is responsible for dealing with the specialty pharmacies and, and communicating with patients, and we try to make that happen as quickly and as seamlessly as, as possible, although uh, it frequently is not the case. So here there are a handful of, I'm loving these questions coming in. Um, this one's directed to Dr. Snow, but I would love to know both of your answers here. And it has to do with interchangeability, which we haven't addressed really uh, meaningfully here yet, but... We know that there is at least one interchangeable for the adalimumab biosimilars that could come to market next year, which changes things potentially where a pharmacist could automatically substitute. Do interchangeability studies change the way you think about switching a patient to a biosimilar? Does that increase the comfort level for you? Yeah, you know, it has. Um, and I think that it, it maybe not in the way that that uh, you, would, you would think of it at first. The biggest way for me is the repetitive switching back and forth. And so, um, you know, Humira or adalimumab or any kind of bi or any kind of monoclonal antibody, we do see secondary failures. 
which is antibody development. The, you know, the human body develops antibodies to foreign things. If you have um, adalimumab floating around for a long period of time, you're going to develop antibodies that clear it from circulation and you can get secondary failure, meaning the drug works at first and then it stops working with time. And so one of my bigger concerns was that if you're switching back from drug A to drug B to drug A to drug B, are you going to accelerate the development of, of, of antibodies that clear the drug? And interchangeability studies have eased my mind in that regard to some degree. You know, it, it doesn't go over what happens when you go from drug A to drug B to drug C to drug D, you know, when you have multiple biosimilars. But at the same time, I do think the interchangeability studies have, have helped me in that regard um, be a little more comfortable with things. Dr. Gross? Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think that um, I think that we have to rely on the FDA to make us feel comfortable that the interchangeability studies are, are valid when we're going to make these substitutions for our patients. Here's another one. And I, you know, this one is interesting because we don't have on the self-administered side, we just, we don't have the patient volume. We don't have any yet in the U.S. on the self-administered side, but even on the medical um, benefit side or the physician administered side, you know, the, you know, the, the patient population who has had exposure to biosimilars is still relatively small. So, um, so this question, I'm, I'm curious um, what, what your, Thoughts are here, but it it the 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 questioner asked um, you know, that you're flagging concerns associated with switching, and we've heard in the previous panel that for some patients biosimilars didn't work, but switching back to the reference product did. So the question is, how often are providers seeing this in practice, and in what way is the biosimilar product not working for patients? And I I'm going to add my own little spin to this question, which is, um, you know, we have heard increasingly, and in, over the the last few months and years even. Um, data suggesting that some negative experiences with switching can be due to the nocebo effect. So I would be curious what your thoughts are on that, and and what and if to the extent that you are seeing patients having negative experiences, do you think it's because of that? Do you think it's because of other things? Like what's really going on there? In dermatology, you know, we we really haven't had the opportunity um, to use the biosimilar as much, with the exception of of Remicade and and um, you know, so far, the our experience um, with with the Remicade biosimilar um, with Renflexus is that the you know the patients that we referred to infusions have have done very well. So it's really hard for me to answer that question. You know, we heard in the patient panel one of the patients who was switched and 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 didn't do well um, with regard to arthritis. But, um, you know, in, in dermatology, we just don't don't have that experience yet. Yeah, I think that um, generally patients have done very well um, with, with biosimilars overall. If you look at, you know, the data that's, that's trickling in a little bit, we're starting to see some real world data in addition to some of the data from Europe, which, which you know, goes back a, a few years. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting you mentioned the nocebo effect and in, in the studies that were done there, one of the studies that, that did show a significant um, uh, let's see, re remission rate or basically significant flare rate, um, a lot of, if you actually broke down how they calculated flares, a lot of it was subjective, meaning that it was more of a, you know, a pain level going from a, a, a five, to a three to a five, and you were seeing some things that were subjective and the objective measurements were, were not changing much. I, I think it goes back to, and, and a lot of the authors on, on this, on that study felt that the way that, that the switch up to a biosimilar was um, discussed with the patient, you know, basically the more education, um, the better they felt they did. And because think about it, if, if, you, if you're on a medication, you know, works and you're doing well, and they walk in and someone walks in and they hand you the medication and say, yeah, you're taking this now. And they, and they walk out of the room, you're going to be like, what the heck? Why, you know, I've been doing so well. Why are you changing me? But if you actually have the discussion, like, look, this medicine is biologically um, nearly identical and this has been tested before. And we've, we've proven that this has the same efficacy in different disease states. Your, your thought process is going to be a little bit different. Right. So this this question I've been saving towards the end because it's I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say provocative, but maybe it could be seen that way. And it really gets to the essence of not even just how and when to communicate with patients, but whether to. Uh, so mm -hmm. the question is if the FDA approved the biosimilar to have the same clinical efficacy and safety as the reference biologic, why is the patient being told they will not be on the same medications? When you give a patient a generic, do you say they are mm -hmm. being switched to a new medication? So generally what are your what are your thoughts there? Dr. Snow, we'll start with you. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so, you know, as, as a physician every day, you have to make decisions on um, how deep into the weeds do you get when you explain things to patients. Um, and, and simply because, you know, I, we could explain the biochemistry, but if, if we lose you after two sentences, it doesn't do any good. Um, so the, what, the comparison I use is, is, as I tell patients, these molecules are a thousand times larger than your aspirin. So like if you take an aspirin, these molecules are so much larger that the scale is so much greater. <clears throat> so it's kind of like building, a, building an empire state building one, you have the same blueprints and you build it on one side of the street and then you go the other side of the street and you build it. The buildings are going to be nearly identical, but the doorknobs may be a slightly different color. The paint may be a slightly different color. It's going to look a little bit different on the inside, just slightly. And just to let them know that it's so I can't call it an identical. I can't call it generic because it is not 100% identical, but that's, that's, a, that's what the terminology is using. And then I usually finish it by saying, but from, from my point of view, this is basically a generic. Um, and, and, and that, that's how I do it. Um, and I think that that's, I, I've got pretty reasonable um, responses from my patients when they seem to understand it, you know, if I kind of portray it in that way. I, I actually like that approach. I like that explanation. I'm going to use it. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, but I wonder, and then I would love to open this up to, um, the patient panelists as well. We can sort of use this as a, as a quick sort of lightning round, um, kind of last thoughts, uh, sort of, sort of question, but because you're not just taking a pill or, you know, like a generic, you may get a bottle that looks exactly the same. Perhaps the label has something different on it, but you may or may not be looking at it. This to me seems a little bit more involved where the injection device is likely going to be different. You're, there's no way the patient isn't going to notice that there are differences. And therefore, how much does that play into whether you would have that conversation and make that communication with the patient. So, you know, I'm curious uh, on, on the provider side, sort of what your thoughts are there as clinicians, how much difference can a patient truly expect in terms of their actual experience and the delivery of the, of the drug? How much does that play into the need to communicate? And then I would love um, any feedback from each of our patient panelists on what they've heard and sort of any final messages that they would have for our attendees today. Um, Dr. Gross, let's start with you. It's, it's definitely going to require an explanation, you know, when the patient gets a, a, a box with the name of a different drug on it. And I think that all the points that we've hit on in the last, you know, hour or so are important. Um, so, you know, the patient needs to be reassured that the FDA says that the medication is, is interchangeable, that we don't anticipate that there's going to be any significant differences in in safety or efficacy. But, you know, as I said earlier, every patient is different and there are going to be some patients who are not going to respond as well. And there are other patients who are going to do just great. And, you know, every time we give a, a patient the medication, no matter what it's for, it, it's, it's a trial. And, and you know, um, some patients um, are going to respond and some patients are not going to respond. And the patients that respond, we, we, you know, we, we claim that as a victory and the patients who don't respond, we have to move on to, to plan B. Uh, Dr. Snow, there are actually a couple of other really interesting questions that came into the chat and then one for Deb. So this will, I think this will work well. Um, all right, so the, I'm gonna roll two of these together. Would love your thoughts. One is, uh, would you use a different biosimilar versus switching back to a reference when the biosimilar does not work? So that's question one. And then the next question is, uh, this has to do more, I think, with provider uh, prescribing habits, per perhaps, um, as these things co come on market. Do you think once interchangeable biosimilars are available and payers mandate switching to certain biosimilars that some physicians would choose a different branded biologic to avoid the situation where a stable patient might have to be switched? So those kind of two questions together for you, Dr. Snow. And then Deb, I'm coming to you next. Um, <clears throat> the first question, you know, I think that that if if they have been on reference you know, we'll just use Humira since it's, since it's I don't even have the, the bio originator. If, if they've done well on that and, and I have the opportunity, I go to buy a similar doesn't work or if something happens, I would love to go back to the, the, the I would like to go back to what we know works. Um, you know, in the end, it, it hopefully that we'd have that opportunity. If we don't have that opportunity, I probably still would stick in the biosimilar family of, of adalimumab, but, but th that depends on, on my discussion with my patient and, and deciding where we go. Um, briefly, the second, the second comment, you know, I think that it's, that it's important. Um, and, and one thing that, that my conversations with rheumatologists from all across the country, um, 
they, they mentioned different mechanism of action or different brand of biologic. I don't think we would. So when, when I make a decision on what medication I use for my patient, there's a reason behind it. It's not because I'm, I'm picking out a, a drug out of a hat. There's a reason. It, it may be that, that the patient is of childbearing age. It may, there's, there's so many things that go into my decision. It, it, it's, not, it's not random. And so I'm not going to avoid a biosimilar. Um, I'm not going to choose something other than adalimumab because I want to avoid a biosimilar, but I'm going to choose a medicine I think is best for my patient. And, and that's, that's what it boils down to. Um, and I think rheumatologists, when you look at the survey results, the, the biggest concern is, is losing that control to, to do what you think is best for your patient. Thank you for that. Um, Deb, there was a clarification question about your experience switching to a biosimilar. Could you clarify, was it the reference product Revocade to the biosimilar or was it a completely different reference product to the biosimilar? I saw that question. So I did go back to the reference product, which was Remicade. And um, it wasn't a negative um, experience. It's just that it didn't work and the same. But I will also caveat by saying that going back to Remicade was only a short amount of time too, that that continued to work. So I ended up having to move on from there. And again, my situation is so unique as far as the, the medications that have worked um, have been Humira that lasted the longest and rituxin and they're completely different mechanisms. So um, it's just kind of a I'll caveat by saying crapshoot as far as, mm -hmm. but also what Dr. Snow was saying, there is a reason for every medication and there's so much shared decision-making with between myself and my rheumatologist. They'll say, okay, so you have failed, blah, blah. And she'll list them all out on a piece of paper. And she's like, our next buckets are going to be this one, this one, and this one. What are your feelings? So um, just a quick decision. I just wanted to back up what Dr. Snow said, because that I respect so much in a rheumatologist. And I'm sure you're the same, Dr. Gross, but Dr. Snow said it. So, <laughs> so again, I love that. I want to get final thoughts. So we're going to go five minutes over and hopefully everyone who's with us can stay with us an extra five minutes. So let me start with Rick. Kind of final thoughts, takeaways, a best practice or recommendation you would leave stakeholders with and then Ted and Nicole. Best practice I can think of is educate, 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 educate the doctor, educate patients, and use use patients to help educate patients. I think that I think that we stand at a precipice of such a unique opportunity, and we do not want to lose it because because we do this wrong. Uh, the way that we would do it wrong would be to begin by uh, making requirements of people who are stable on medication to change to a different medication solely for the benefit of cost. I think that unless there is a cost differential built in, people stable on a medication ought to be allowed to stay where they're at. And perhaps when we switch, we should be able to go on a six-month trial or something, something along, along those lines. I think I just reiterate a lot of things I said before, other panelists have said before, uh, educate, communicate, make sure that you're getting that messages from the doctors to the patients as soon as possible. From the patient perspective, uh, advise them that what's involved and don't be scared of something that's a biosimilar. Um, it should work, but again, make sure there's that feedback loop to, to provide it back to the doctor in case it's not. But the other thing is, I know there are questions raised about well, why even tell someone if it's basically like a generic, just, just give it to them and don't advise them it's even a change. To those of us who have had arthritis for any length of time, rheumatoid or other psoriatic or whatever, we have been through a gamut of different drugs and treatments and invariably certain things work and certain things don't. And we're quite cognizant of what we're taking and what is working and what is not. And it's not like an antibiotic where unless we've had it before, if a doctor says this by antibiotic, I don't know, it's the same pill, I'll, I'll take it and I assume it's going to work. Whereas those of us who've been through, it have often been through the ringer and we finally find something that works. We're going to know if it's different, not just because it's a different application device right. and different packaging, but we are highly attuned to what we're getting. So we need to be advised if we're changing why, why it's good for you and, and why you shouldn't be afraid of it. I want to reiterate education, communication, and also partnerships, partnerships with your healthcare provider and partnerships also with the associations. 
Um, a quick little story. Um, as I mentioned, I've tried many, many medications and the current biologic I'm on, I was running out of options. And I, I found out through the National Psoriasis Foundation that a, the, a very new biologic just became available for psoriatic arthritis. And I knew basically at the same time as my rheumatologist and she was quite impressed. I was asking her if I could try it next. And so I think those partnerships with both, you know, working with both your healthcare provider, your doctors, and also foundations that are, that are on top of the latest research and the latest products available that, you know, that, that that's very important. I think we'll end there. That's a good point to end on. I see a couple of other questions have come in over the past couple of minutes. So maybe what we can do is when we stop the recording, staff can stay on and address some of those questions in the chat so that they're available for uh, all the attendees. We'll certainly be following up with both an email summary of what you heard today, in addition to a survey. We would love to get your feedback on how you intend to uh, communicate with patients or what sort of your practices might be going forward into 2023. So we hope that you all will take that survey with us. But I want to take the time to thank our panelists for joining us today. This has been very insightful. I, I think we've gotten a, a pretty wide range of, of perspectives and opinions here, which I think is really important because it reflects the fact that there are many perspectives and opinions on this matter. And there is no one size fits all approach to thinking about it. So thank you all. We really appreciate your time on this very important topic today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.